why 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 do i do the bind up before i vlog hello my name is ali and this is my channel where i talk about what i'm knitting how it's going and what it's costing me and i'm coming to you today from just outside toronto with arguably one of my best mugs my chip mug look at him isn't he cute and i'm drinking my favorite sloan classic earl grey as per usual as for what i'm wearing today we're, we're really leaning into the like art slash kindergarten teacher <laughs> aesthetic this is my barnsley sweater from cheryl Mokhtari. this is a pattern that i like can't super endorse because i realized after it only goes up to like a 48 inch bust so like I feel like I feel like I need to see that size range go up a bit before I want to knit another one of her patterns but it is a very cozy sweater it's also a little bit snug on me because I made this this was between I think June and August of last year that I knit this and that was sort of when I figured out <laughs> that my gauge consistently comes out tight um and so I did not go up a size in my needles for this and I should have so it doesn't have as much ease on me as it's intended to when I put it on actually the arms feel like tight when I put it on in a way that I remember when I first finished it I was really concerned about um and once it's on I don't notice at all and it's totally fine but it's also not like supposed to be that way <laughs> so now I know to upsize my needles most of the time I also really like whenever I'm wearing one of my knits on the channel to look at how much wear I've gotten out of it so far so like I said I finished this early last fall and so far I've worn it 25 times which like, I feel like that's pretty good considering it hasn't been that long. The entire project cost was about 160 Canadian, which is like just under 120 US, which makes my current cost per wear 640 Canadian or 470 US. So like if I wore this sweater zero more times, I would not feel like that was a very good value. <laughs> but based on the fact that I've worn it that much already, this is definitely feeling like it's on its way to being a really good investment. It just needs a little more time to prove itself. Now today, kind of exciting. I think we're gonna do a little giveaway. Now the other day I was kind of doing a clean out of my like knitting project bin that sits beside my couch that I kind of just put everything in that I'm working on recently. And I'm, we're doing finger quotes <laughs> because when one does not frequently revisit and declutter the bin, it becomes, Hi, Copper. You found some crumbs. Good for you. It becomes more like things I'm currently working on and the graveyard of all the extra yarn from projects that have been finished or projects that I started and swatched and then decided, okay, now's not the time. Like, actually, I'm going to cast on something else. And sort of all of these things just accumulate into a bin of. What? What have. What? Show me. What have you got? Hi. <laughs> So it was just kind of a bin of miscellany. And one of the things that I found in that bin was these little shorty needles from Chiaogu. So you'll notice these are still in their package because I bought these, I think toward the end of last year, I was working on dad's socks that I made him for Christmas. And I had just recently heard about the concept of these teeny tiny shorty needles for like really small circumference work like socks. And I was like, I don't hate magic loop. I'm content with it. But like, I don't love the flipping around, you know, and sliding all the stitches back and forth. I also don't, I don't know. I know a lot of people love DPNs. I've never tried DPNs. There's just something about them that just like really does not appeal to me. Um, I do intend to try them at some point, but when I heard about these, this was more appealing to me than the idea of DPNs. So I was like, let me pick up these. I use them for about two minutes. These are not for me. And I hated it. What a great intro to a giveaway. <laughs> but... I do know that there are a lot of people who swear by them, who love these for small circumference work because you don't have to do any magic loop, you don't have to do any DPNs, you just work it like you work a regular circular project. You can just do your stock in it or whatever you're doing and not have to shift anything around. It sounds glorious and apparently for some people it actually is. So if that is you or you think that it might be you and you're curious to try these out, I like, like I said, I use these for two minutes and then I stuck them back in the package. So I feel like someone could get a lot more use out of these than I'm going to because that use will be zero. So these are the nine inch or 23 centimeter circulars from Chowgu. This is the Knit Red collection. And these ones are the US 7 or 4.5 millimeter needles. So if you would like these, or are you even just curious to find out if you would like these, stay tuned for the end of the video and I will give details on how to enter the giveaway. Okay, we don't have any finished objects this week and we also don't have any acquisitions. This is a week of whips so let's get into it okay so if you've been here before you know that my no frills cardigan is um a long-term project however 
we are starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. So like I said, I'm knitting the No Frills Cardigan by Petite Knit. This is a pattern that accommodates up to a 59 inch bust. So I'd like to see that pushed a little bit further, but we are way out of the Barnsley sweater. And I am knitting the size extra small. The pattern itself also costs 45 Danish kroner or about $9 Canadian. I'm knitting this out of, actually let me grab it. It's in my giant project bag. Okay, so this is a combo of the Knitting for Olive Merino in the color Mustard and the We Are Knitters Touch Me Mohair also in the color mustard. Um, also not really mohair, mostly alpaca. I feel like I've said that 700 times on this channel now, but in case you're new, you gotta know. I bought both yarns separately, both from their respective companies and the total cost, including shipping and duty, which I got hit with on the Knitting for Olive order. All in, it cost about $230 Canadian for the yarn or about 240, including the pattern, which works out to about 175 US, which, is that a lot of money? Yes, however, if you're unfamiliar with the No Frills cardigan, this is also a very long cardigan. <laughs> so there's definitely a lot more yarn going into this than into your average garment because the idea is that this is going to be like duster length. Now this pattern is written to be knit on size four millimeter needles, but I'm now in my era of understanding that I'm a tight knitter. So I'm knitting this on four and a half millimeter needles and that is giving me perfect stitch gauge and I'm coming up a little short on row gauge, but I'm hoping that just gravity will make up the difference over the scheme of this long cardigan, or that I just have enough yarn that I can knit the extra rows and it's fine because the sleeves fit fine, like the sleeve holes didn't end up being too shallow, and that's really the only thing in this design where the row gauge would really be a concern. So this is a raglan style cardigan with a little bit of a v-neck and one by one ribbed edging, but it kind of, it, it's so kind of, collapses in on itself that it almost doesn't look ribbed. It almost looks more just like stockinette or or even maybe you could confuse it for double knit, but like at a distance. I would, I think really at some point like to do a cardigan that has a double knit button band. They just look so like luxe. And I don't think that was a thing that was really on my radar when I started this project. Like in retrospect, I'm a little like, maybe I would have liked one with a double knit button band, but we are in way too far for that now. And this is a band that is knit simultaneously with the rest of the cardigan. So it's not like this is something that I could just change what I'm doing it at the end. I cast this on January 5th. They've now spent January, February, March on it. And honestly, I think I'm ahead of where I thought I would be at this point. I kind of figured this project was gonna take me like six months, but I am definitely beyond halfway and um, good thing because I'm definitely more than halfway done my yarn. And the fabric is a little bit different than it was the last time that I talked about it on the channel because I've done my mid project block. This is fresh off the blocking mat. Today is Sunday that I'm recording this. On Friday night, I decided, okay, I think it's time. Took my measurement, I measured from the top of the back of the neck, just below where the ribbing starts all the way down to the bottom. And as of Friday, I had 33 inches there. And as of today, blocked, I have 34 inches there, which is interesting to me. I decided to do a mid-project block because I figured, okay, if this is gonna be a duster length cardigan, there's not a lot of margin for error in terms of the length. Like I don't want it to end up hitting kind of like a weird, awkward height that seems too short. And I also don't want it literally dusting the floor or it's gonna get worn out really, really quickly. So it's important that this is the right length. And I thought, okay, over the course of a cardigan this long, there's a lot of room for even the slightest bit of growth in blocking to really compound over the length of this. And I'm like, there's a chance that this could add like six inches here. I don't know. I don't really know what I'm expecting, but I realized when I measured it, but I was expecting more than that. So today I learned that this combo of yarns does not seem to grow a whole lot in blocking. Um, which honestly is good. Like I, either way, I think it would have been fine. I could just do my math to calculate what percent it grew by. But knowing that it's almost one-to-one, -one, like I'm not even going to be knitting another 33 inches. I don't need that much more length, even close. Whatever I knit from here is not going to grow by more than an inch. So it should be fairly simple from here to get it to the right length. Now, hmm, knock on wood, <laughs> because that just seems like a dangerous thing to say. And there is also the factor of just when I wear it a few times, how much is it going to start to sort of sag and pull itself down under its own weight? So I do feel like there is kind of a degree to which I still need to be cautious about the length. And I'm also wondering if similar to doing a mid-project block, if I need to do kind of like a mid-project, like multi-day wear <laughs> test, like just wear it around unfinished around the house for a few days, just to give it a chance to kind of like settle under its own weight a little bit. Maybe what I need to do, I've been talking about doing the afterthought pockets that are written into the pattern as sort of a mid-thought, like not leaving them all the way to the end. So maybe what I should do is go ahead and make those pockets so that then I can put the attached yarn balls in the pocket so they have little containers <laughs> so that I can then more easily 
wear this project around for a few days. Is that a weird thing to do? I feel like that might be a smart thing to do. So last time that I showed this on the channel, there's my stitch marker. Okay, I put on this marker at where we were. And as you can see, quite a bit has happened since then because this is the main thing that I've been knitting on since then. Is it the only? I think it's the only thing actually that I've been knitting on since I finished that other than since Friday when this went on the blocking mat, which we'll get into in a minute what I've been doing since then. But so last time I tried this on on camera, it was kind of like right above the butt. And let's see where it is now. This also kind of matches my outfit in a weird way. Okay, that is a pretty long cardigan. Now, I was a little concerned and might, might be true that the sleeves were kind of the perfect length before I blocked them, which in retrospect, kind of dangerous because if I thought the rest of this was gonna grow, what did I think was gonna happen to the sleeves? What a great question. However, sometimes I find that sleeves kind of shrink as you wear a sweater. If I pretend to be a bird for a second, let them fully loose, like they kind of end up, they do end up covering like most of my hand, kind of down to my thumbs, which is not ideal. I do like a really long sleeve, but to me a long sleeve is like to the knuckles here on my hands, not like covering all my fingers. So I don't know, maybe we'll see if I do my mid-project wear test, how these feel, if they do kind of seem to shorten. And if not, then I might have to undo my beautiful tubular bind off and rip out a little and then do it again. Why, 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 why do I do the bind off before I block? But in terms of the cardigan itself, like look at that, like this actually, I feel like this is a length of cardigan. I don't know what you call this length, but some cardigans are this length. And we're about to get into kind of like a no man's land that is a weird length of cardigan until it reaches duster length, which again becomes like a real length of cardigan. <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is very long. I'm pretty happy with that for three months of knitting at like, I think a DK weight. For me, like I, I know that there are people who knit a lot faster than this. There are people who are like, I've been gone for three weeks. Here's the four sweaters I've completed. That's not the world that I live in. So this is where we get into, did I order the right amount of yarn? Like maybe 15 more inches? Is that true? It's very hard to do this without like leaning and messing up my measurement. I don't know, around a foot, maybe a little more than a foot, I think is what I need from here. So let's, let's do some measuring. Okay, so we can actually measure, because I have not woven in the ends, we can measure how much length I got out of one ball on the most recent switch. So, okay, so I'm holding this upside down. You can see here is where the most recent complete ball started. And then it ended over on this side here. Can you see that, that strand coming out there? So we have, <laughs> it's tricky. I have to measure from here to here, but <laughs> only this way. One moment, please. Trying to like align these enough to measure them properly. It kind of feels like when you try to measure something with like your hands, right? You're like the end table is this wide. Okay, now I just have to walk over here like this. I, is anybody else thinking of Natalie Tran community channel, YouTube, like 2007? Anyway, so this is definitely not, this is not going to be a high degree of accuracy, but what we're going for here is um, better than guessing out of nowhere. Okay, so it looks like I'm getting about eight inches per ball. Um, like I said, I think we need probably between 12 and 15 inches to finish it, plus a little bit extra for pockets. So in terms of the yarn that we still have available, these are the balls that I'm currently knitting off of. Like this merino is relatively new. I've kind of used just enough to take like the really pretty looking layer of wraps off of it. So now it's revealed like the crisscrossiness. And this is about half or more of the mohair alpaca because these balls are giant. They are almost twice as much length as these are. So if we're gonna be like on the safe side, we'll say that I have half each left of these. Oh, oh, good news. Okay, actually, <laughs> maybe too good of news. Maybe, maybe so good that it's bad because I have three entire balls left. So is this the first time in my entire knitting career that I have like an active surplus of yarn? <laughs> I've had projects where it worked out that I had enough. I've had a lot of projects where I ended up having to buy more yarn, probably as a byproduct of being a tight knitter. More stitches, same amount of space. So interesting. By these calculations, um, there's a solid chance that I'm going to end up with possibly two entire balls of yarn left or more likely probably like one and like 90% of one by the time I get the pockets done. Um, we'll see, but I might have some yarn I need to figure out what to do with when I'm done. So that's, I mean, not ideal that I paid more money than I need to probably for this project, but am I proud of myself for actually ordering sufficient quantities of yarn? Yes, yes I am. Oh God, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of the Touch Me Mohair, um, we're set because re remember 
these are basically twice as long as the other ones. So this basically equates to six of the merinos plus the half we got left. And I did know that I was pretty confident I was ordering a really excessive amount of this, but when I got it, it was half off and I was concerned that they were discontinuing it. And I was like, in no world am I getting 80% done this cardigan and then running out of mohair and not being able to finish the cardigan with a matching mohair because it's now discontinued. This was not an option. So because these were half price, they were so like relatively affordable that I was like, we're just gonna order like definitely enough. <laughs> Worst case scenario, I love this color. I have tons of things in my house that are this color. I like wearing this color. Like the odds that I could not find something to do with this color if I had it left over, non-existent. So we ordered lots to be safe and we are, by the looks of it, um, very, very safe. <laughs> Oh my god, oh my god, I found a fourth. Extremely safe. I, I think that I only ordered eight of these in the first place, which means that so far I've only used three and a half of these on this entire cardigan. <laughs> so these go a very, 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 very long way. In terms of the merino, I started out with 10 of these, so that means that I've now used about six and a half. I also, in an earlier episode where I was talking about this cardigan, I mentioned having issues <laughs> trying to figure out like, how to pull the yarn, like the dilemma of, is this a project where I should pull from the outside or the inside? And how much is that informed by which type of yarn it is? And I tend to default to pulling from the inside because you don't have to worry about the ball like rolling around. And I was having a lot of issues with that with this project, particularly with the mohair balls, because there's just so much length that it collapses so much as you go. And I did get some interesting tips. There are people suggesting that pulling from the center works better if you have something to contain it in. Like if you stick it in a little jar or something, it keeps it from like bleh, all over the place which makes sense. But I did decide to try just pulling from the outside for both of them, which I was trying to avoid initially thinking, well, if I have two balls, they're just gonna be like bouncing all over each other and getting all tangled. Somehow this actually has not been an issue at all. And I've much preferred working on this since I started pulling from the outside. So it doesn't really make sense to me, but it is working. So we're going to go with it. So that's really all the update that I've got today on that cardigan. And maybe next time it will have pockets. Yes. What is it? All right, next up in the whips, we've got a new cast on. So since I put my cardigan on the blocking mat on Friday night, I had a little Saturday where I needed something to knit. So this is a little one, as you can tell, in my uh, Shakespeare and Company bag that my mom brought back for me from Paris last year. So last week I posted a video that was sort of like a bonus video of what I bought on my trip and the knits that I took. And one of the yarns that I bought while I was in Venice has become my new project. So this is the Cecia Ulysse yarn. It is 100% wool. And it is the color 1605, very poetic. And I mentioned at the time that I was thinking it might be a good candidate for the dog walking gloves that I've mentioned sort of percolating in the back of my head as a thing that I'd like to do. So I went looking to see if I could find any patterns that would act as a good starting point. Because when I talked about wanting to make dog walking gloves, I was saying I have sort of like specific criteria that make no real existing gloves that I've ever seen make sense. So like, Short version of the story, we need to be able to access treats, which means I need like a non-negligible amount of dexterity where like regular gloves I find frustrating and I will only wear them when it's like really, really, really cold and I kind of have no other choice. But I was saying that I would kind of like a pair of gloves that's like fingerless gloves, except that only these two fingers are fingerless <laughs> so that I can still use these to like pluck food, but that these ones don't have to be colder than they need to be. But when I mentioned this, a few people did mention the idea of trigger finger gloves, which I had never heard of. I just like don't really have anyone in my circle who would like have those. <laughs> so for those of you like me who've never seen them, trigger finger mitts are like mittens, except that the index finger has its own separate pocket. So it has like a glove and the rest of your hands are like in a mitten so that you can still pull a trigger. So I was thinking like, okay, maybe I would use the pattern for a trigger mitt and then just make these two fingers fingerless, just bind off before you get to the top. So I started browsing patterns and I'm thinking more as I'm looking at different patterns and I've kind of settled on like a weird, like Frankenstein-y situation, but that I think is going to be good, I think, but we're, we're figuring it out. So I decided to use as my starting point, the Bridge Arm Warmers by Kukiko Inoue, which you might look at these and say, this looks like none of the things you were just talking about. <laughs> and you are correct, but, Hear me out. So I have essentially completed one of these. Now, this knit up very, very quickly. This is a bulky weight project. And interestingly, at first I wasn't sure that I would be able to use this yarn because when I look at this, I think that what it's telling me is that in a 10 centimeter swatch, it's going to be 10 stitches and 12 rows. 
in 10 centimeters, which would mean that one centimeter is one stitch. Like that's a giant stitch. Like that's not just bulky, that's like ginormous. But then like when I look at this, like it doesn't seem that huge. And then I looked it up on Ravelry and it's not entered on Ravelry very many times. So it's possible that this is just like an error, but it said that it's two wraps per inch. Like that's huge. And I'm like looking at this thinking, this seems like yarn that looks roughly the same size as the yarn in this pattern. So none of this is making sense to me. We're just, we're just gonna try it. So this pattern is written to be knit on a six millimeter needle and it's a one size pattern. So I'm knitting the only size. Now, in terms of the cost of the yarn for this project, I bought two balls of this from Lella Bella in Venice and I lost my receipt. So I'm not sure exactly how much this was because I also bought another skein at the same time, but I'm guessing that they were about $40 Canadian or $30 US. That's kind of my best guess. This is also a free pattern. We love a free pattern. So I did kind of like a teeny tiny gauge swatch when I started these. I basically knit like this much and then was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I found in doing that, that in the stitch pattern that these use, which is like a half twisted rib, I was getting like exactly gauge and I hadn't blocked the little swatch that I had done because I think I'm going to need like every gram of yarn that is here. And so I didn't want to later have to be working with yarn that had already been blocked. So not knowing how much it's gonna open up in blocking, but just thinking back to previous experience with ribbing, I find ribbing often opens a decent amount in blocking. So since I was getting perfect gauge pre-blocking and like I have quite like narrow hands, I decided to actually size down for my needles to a 5.5, which like me, sizing down on needles, unheard of. So the way these are done is you cast on at the bottom and then you work up from here. You do a little bit of a gusset for the thumb and then you split off and do the thumb separately from the rest of it. All right, so I'll put it on to show you. So it has a tubular cast on, which this is my first time doing one of those. So that was interesting. It was funny because as I was doing it, I was thinking, oh wow, I feel like I hear people like complain about these and not liking doing them. And you know what? Like I'm really not finding it that bad, it's fine. And then I realized when I was kind of in like row three of four of doing the setup, I was like, oh, I messed up in this one spot. Like I'm either gonna have to like be okay with that part being a little bit funky or I need to go back and start over again. And having just had all these thoughts of like, oh, it's not that bad. I don't know what people are complaining about. I was like, no, no, it was fine. But do I wish to do it again? No. So we carried on. There was just a spot where I had missed one of the yarn overs. So I ended up doing a make one in one of the later setup rounds. So it just meant that I had a little like blip kind of missing in the initial row. But I was like, that's, that's something that I can just like feed and end through there and like pull it tight and then weave it in later, that's fine. So this is what we've got. So I've already made some modifications to this. So one of them is that I did not do as many rows here as are written in the pattern. I knew that because I only had two of these, I wasn't confident that I was going to have enough yarn to do the full length version. And I also wanted to knit this part higher. So both the thumb and the rest of the fingers actually have more rows than are written in the pattern because I really wanted like maximum coverage for warmth while just having like fingertips available for dexterity. I also have some fun um, danglies going on. But I'm thinking that I might have to do a little bit of surgery because these still ended up being longer than I thought they were going to be. So I was kind of trying these on as I was knitting and I was having a hard time figuring out sort of exactly how the thumb gusset was going to fit and therefore where my hand would land in them. So at one point I had done only 20 rows here and I was like, oh, you know what? I think it's time to start the thumb gusset. And I try it on and then I realize, oh, but like, I think at first I was thinking the thumb gusset would start sort of lower, like closer to the base of the thumb. And then looking at the project photos, I was like, oh no, it's really just where it like really starts to branch off dramatically from the rest of your hand. Okay, that makes sense. So if that's the case, if this section I'm working on right now has to include kind of like half the height of my hand also, I need to knit more rows. So I did, and then I started the thumb gusset and then somehow it then seemed like, no, no, you should have started it before when it seemed like it was gonna be too soon because I thought when I started the thumb gusset that these were gonna end up hitting around here. <laughs> and as you can see, there's a lot of rows below that. and. I think that I'm gonna need that yarn because I'm not planning on leaving these like this. So my thought process in using this pattern was that I could make these and then give myself some options of how I'm going to wear them. So just like this, I can wear these in sort of moderate cold situations and just have regular nice fingerless gloves. And I'm going to kind of improvise an additional add-on piece, but crucially not a typical flap like in convertible gloves because I've tried convertible gloves for dog walking and I find them to be a problem because my hands are going in and out of like a pocket or a treat pouch and the flap when it's not over your hand 
tends to like get stuck on the pocket. So I did not want anything that would just sort of be like flopping at the back. Like even if it's Velcroed, it still kind of catches. It's just, it's just annoying. But what I'm thinking is that I can make like a little, just like a little like top of a mitten, almost like a hat that goes over my hand that I would put on and then it kind of tucks in below here. So on the days where it is cold and I need the extra warmth, I can wear the two pieces together, have it overlap by a little bit so they stay nice and snug. And on the days where I don't need it, I don't need to have it on. Now, as if that doesn't already sound probably like a strange idea, I'm also planning to combine this with the idea of the trigger glove, by which I mean that this funny little top of mitten that I knit for my hand is actually only going to be for these fingers <laughs> and not this one so that these ones can be covered, but I still have full pinchy, pinchy dexterity. So that's what I'm currently thinking. Um, the problem though, and why I think I might need to do surgery, is that this is all that I have left of my yarn ball, and I'm not confident <laughs> that that's enough. I did try starting the top portion, but ended up ripping it out and having to restart. Because initially I was thinking that it would be best if I could knit it from the top down, because then I would just sort of give as much overlap between the two pieces as I had enough length for. And I thought like, okay, if I can start the top, like, you know, I would just do it like, like an eight stitch tube and then mattress stitch the top closed at the end. So then I can just do my increases from there and it'll be easy to sort of put it on and see like, okay, at what rate do I need to add increases to fit the fingers as they go down? But I was just finding when I was trying this that like, it was just too small and too fiddly. Like I couldn't really see what I was doing or what was what and then I was also finding that my increases were looking like they were kind of creating some gaps like it just wasn't ideal and I concluded okay this is going to work out better if I can do this from the bottom up. I don't think that's going to cut it so I think that I'm going to start the little top part I'll see how far I get but there's a very high chance that I'm going to need to um, put in a lifeline and do some knitting surgery to kind of cut off a couple inches of this and then do a tubular bind off instead of cast on to finish it and then use that spare yarn that I've salvaged to do this one. So this is why I decided to knit these one at a time. I figured there would be some trial and error. I usually like knitting two at a time, but when I'm sort of making things up as I go, it didn't really seem like the best way to go. And this, this is reinforcing that. So when I get this one finished, I will know how much I was able to do. And then I can just look at it, count my rows and um, do it properly the first time on the next one. <laughs> these are also very warm, like I, <laughs> I'm kind of overheating with this on right now just sitting here, but that makes me very encouraged for their use in the future. I'm also thinking with the little like top of mitten add-on that I might, that depending on how it seems when I have them both together, I might add snaps on the inside so that I do have a way to attach them. Honestly, maybe just as a way to store them together more than anything. And that way, when I'm just wearing these as fingerless gloves, you won't be able to see them. It won't look like any sort of attachment is missing, but they will be there on the inside for when I do add the little mitten add on. <laughs> if it has a snap on the top of it, it can slide under and they can click together and they'll be secure. So that's something that I'm thinking about if it kind of seems like I need it, which I'm not sure, but it's nice to feel like I have options. I'm also really loving how this fabric is knitting up. I think that the black with the little flecks of light brown showing through, it's this really nice kind of like, it's very simple, but like has some interest. And it's funny because I remember when I was talking about um, the Hedgehog Fibers skein that I bought that in looking at variegated yarns, I was kind of learning about what I do and don't like in them and that I'm very fussy about them. And what I concluded that I liked was when there's a variation of hue of like pink to purple purple to blue, but not of light to dark. But what I'm realizing with this is that I actually like this also with the light and dark. I think what I don't like is when it's both. I think that I need variegated yarn to pick. I need you to have either color variation or light dark variation. You just can't do them at the same time. And a lot of them do them both at the same time. And I find them gorgeous as skeins, but knit up into fabric. It's just not my style of thing to wear. So it's been really fun seeing this knit up and being like, oh no, I really do like this light dark situation. These are really cute. I really like them. I did find that <laughs> I think I had a similar issue with um, picking up stitches for the thumb on these that I've had on underarms in the past. So like, let me see if I can contort my hand so you can see this. So you can see like that, that's, that's skin. So I think I had a similar problem here that I have with underarms and I didn't really realize, <laughs> like in retrospect, it basically is like, if this is the body of your sweater, this is basically its sleeve. It's, it's all the same principles. This did not occur to me at the time, so I did not um, leverage the various resources that people were nice enough to give me when I was asking about the underarm problem. So 
this is going to be a case where, again, I think I end up just filling it in when I like weave in these ends, just kind of like cinching things together. But it was just funny to me to realize like, oh no, this is the same problem and it just follows you everywhere. So that's where I'm currently at with these. The last time that I walked copper, it was still cold and I was still wearing gloves. So I'm hoping that if I get through these quickly enough, I will actually be able to use them at least a couple times this season before they disappear until the fall. So wish me luck. Okay, so that's it for my whips. And now I have a few sort of like projects to discuss. Like they're not so much future plans, like they're kind of in the works, but they're also kind of at weird stalled points. We're just, we're just gonna get into it. So last time I was basically like, these are what my dad's socks look like now. This is not how they started looking. The legs used to be much longer. What happened? Help. I mean, the consensus was, Allie, stop using 100% wool on socks. That was, that was very much um, the consensus that I was receiving. And I find this really disappointing <laughs> and I'm kind of puzzled. So let's rewind. So the main advice is use superwash yarn or at the very least use wool with nylon content mixed in to help it sort of like hold its structure. But I've been reluctant to use superwash yarn for dad's socks because you just do lose some of the benefits of wool when it's treated with the superwash process. Like you lose the lanolin, you lose a lot of these rustic qualities that make yarn so good at moisture wicking, at keeping you warm. And of course it still works well, but not as well. And dad's socks are a situation where like, we're really going for like maximum warmth, maximum insulation. And what I don't understand is that like, I believe that superwash processes and even nylon as a material are relatively new. Like, have people not been knitting wool socks for centuries? Like, I'm just trying to understand <laughs> What were people doing before Superwash existed and before Nylon existed? Because, so if you didn't see the last episode, what's happened is that the bottom of dad's socks have felted. And when they have done that, it has started like stealing length from the leg of the sock to become the foot of the sock. So you can see that where the heel now sits, it still has the stitch pattern of the leg of the sock. The actual heel is supposed to be down here. So they have been shortening because the felting has been stealing length from the leg. So I'm like, what? did people used to do? Like, is this just what happened? Like, is this just how wool socks work? And you either knit the foot of your sock extra, extra big so that this can happen and then they become the right size through felting? Or did in like ye olden days, you just like knit thigh highs and eventually they became regular socks? Like, I, I'm just, <laughs> I don't understand. I did also see recommendations that instead of nylon, you can hold a strand of silk with the wool. So like maybe that's what people were doing, but I also feel like a lot of people who had access to wool from their farm or a nearby farm, like did they also have access to silk? Like silk has not historically been like a very affordable or accessible fiber. So like, I guess that's an option now if we don't want to use nylon, but like wh what were the people doing? So my current plan is just to pick up some stitches around the top and just add some extra length to these. But this has me thinking about what I'm gonna do the next time that I knit my dad socks. So honestly, like he loves the material of them so much that I think I will probably just start knitting them longer in the foot to give a little bit more room for them to felt. I also got a recommendation from viewer Simona who said that it sounds like my dad maybe has a high arch foot and that Roxanne Richardson, who as discussed before, apparently has the answer to absolutely everything, that she has a special tutorial for knitting socks for high arch feet. So it might be worth giving that a shot to see if it helps. I also used the Fish Lips Kiss Heel on the last socks that I gave him, which is different from these pairs here, which just use the heel flap and gusset. So maybe fitting the heel differently might also make a difference in how much it does or does not slip down, but we shall see. We are very much in sort of like experiment phase now with dad socks going forward. I also mentioned when I was talking about the socks um, that I hate wet splicing. <laughs> and I mentioned like, if you're watching this being like, you're, you're missing, you're, you're, not, you're not doing it right. And I was missing something, so I'd like to circle back because one of the things that I said was that I don't even find it that great because by the time you get them put together, you get this weird like extra dense strand. Like it just doesn't really blend in with the rest of the fabric very well. So as it turns out, if you've not done wet splicing and wanna try it, you are supposed to remove some of the plies at like the little bit that you're actually joining so that you only have like the same amount of material there where you're joining, which like, Yes. Does this make sense in retrospect? Yes. <laughs> so maybe I will give wet splicing another shot in the future. We will see. Do you have something you'd like to share with the class? Okay, so the last project I want to chat about is the Fausto Bralette by Loki Bold Knit. So this is a pattern that I've been talking about wanting to start for like 
many weeks now. So to recap, it's this bralette pattern. It accommodates up to a 56 inch bust, which I'd like to see it go further than that, but we're, we're still out of the Barnsley sweater. <laughs> I'm planning to knit it in a size 2A, but I say planning to because I'm having the hardest time figuring out how to approach this project. So in my last video, I was talking about my struggle with the fact that this pattern is written to be knit bottom up. And I don't really want to do that because I would like to actually extend this from a bralette into a full length top, including waist shaping. And I think that it would be a lot easier to do waist shaping if it's knit from the top down so that it's more easy to accurately try on along the way. And one of my other considerations for wanting to knit it top down is that there's kind of a range of lengths that it could ultimately land at and be fine but I only have two skeins of the yarn for this project. I really don't want to buy a third. I'm knitting this out of La Bien Aimee Felix in the color Winterfell, and I was gifted one of these from my friend Amy when she did her de-stash, so I only had to buy one. And if I have to buy another one of these, like this is pricey yarn, and this is going to end up being a project that is more expensive than I think it's really like worth to me in my wardrobe. Like even just having to buy one skein has cost me $65 Canadian, 10 of that was shipping. But like, that is a lot of money. It's beautiful yarn. I'm obsessed with the color, but I do not want to spend twice that on this garment, especially knowing that if I use any of that third skein, it's going to be such a small amount that it's going to seem so not worth it. So I really, really need to make this work with two skeins. So I would really prefer to knit it from the top down so I can just use up the yarn that I have and bind off when I'm done. And if I'm knitting it from the bottom up, there's just so much more estimation to do and room for those estimations to ultimately fail. <laughs> so I was asking the last time, given all of these factors, if you were knitting this, how would you approach it? And I had a couple people, Brenda and Laura, both suggest that I just reverse the pattern, just knit it top down. And I was like, interesting. <laughs> Hadn't occurred to me that I could do that. And I was like, okay, like that shouldn't be that hard. Like if I think about, like if I think about in very basic terms, like the structure of a garment, and okay, just yeah, look at the pattern and kind of look where the increases are, look where the decreases are, and just do the opposite. Great. And so I sat down to try to parse this out for this particular pattern. And I spent like a couple hours on it and like really thinking I was really doing something. And then I kind of hit a wall when I realized that like my stitch counts weren't adding up. And it was just, I think that the problem is the gusset at the bust that I just cannot figure out how to reverse. Because when you're going bottom up, there's a point at which you are picking up stitches along the side of a flat panel to start knitting this gusset out of. I'm going from the top down. What is the opposite of picking up stitches out of a side panel? Like it's not just binding off because then it's not a tap. Am I sewing it down? Like I, <laughs> even still I couldn't get my stitch counts to add up. Like at first I tried to go through the pattern just like reading backwards essentially. And then I was like, okay, no, because by the end, the pattern is assuming that you already have all this information about how many stitches you have because you've worked up to this point, right? You start with this many stitches, you do plus this many, minus this many, blah, 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 all the way down until down here, you already know all of those things, which of course you don't if you're working backwards. I'm like, okay, that's not gonna work. So I instead started from the top of the directions and started building like a visual chart instead of the pattern so that I could see how many stitches were where, and then I could later just basically read the chart and just read it from top to bottom rather than from bottom to top. But something about the gusset, I just cannot, I cannot figure it out. Like I think that I just do not have enough of an understanding of garment construction and design at this stage to be able to reverse this particular pattern. Like I feel pretty confident that I could figure it out for something that is knit fully, like flat but the 3d nature of the boob gusset is like really <laughs> really throwing me off so i'm very stuck but now i'm thinking the more i think about it i'm wondering if it actually might not be as bad to knit from the bottom up as i'm thinking for a couple different reasons so number one in thinking about doing knit surgery on the dog walking gloves i'm realizing in theory if i were to run out of yarn on the fausta bralette i could do the same thing there i could put in lifelines and do some surgery and chop a couple inches off the bottom. Like obviously it's not ideal because I spent time knitting that, but like not the end of the world. So that alleviates some of the concern about how much yarn that I have. And then the other concern that I had was just sort of the uncertainty of trying to do waist shaping where I can't try the garment on fully properly because working from the bottom up, like you don't have your straps in place yet and all these things to know where it's gonna sit. But then looking at the project pictures, I'm thinking, I think there is room to kind of just, if I start from the bottom, 
fit it to the waist and it's sitting where it's sitting when I try it on where it fits as I'm intending it to, I think that I should be able to just kind of knit whatever amount straight before the gusset that seems like I need to knit before I need to start a gusset. Like I think that I might be able to feel that out and then the straps just become whatever length the straps need to be for everything to sit where it's supposed to go. I still have some concern there because of the blocking of it all. Like I learned with my classic rib, which was the last time that I improvised some waist shaping that two by two rib, which this project also is, really can open up in blocking and did get longer. So the shaping no longer fit as well as it had before, but then realizing that I could also in this project do a mid project block like I did with my cardigan. So I'm thinking potentially if I just go ahead and do my improvised waist shaping the way that seems to make sense, seems to fit, I can then block it to see how that is and how it actually lands versus how I thought that it was going to post blocking and then keep going from there. So I at least know that the fit of that is not going to change dramatically. And then I can sort of start the gusset as it seems like I'm going to need to based on that. And also with some knowledge that I will gain from the blocking in terms of being able to measure how long was it before, how long is it after. And I can then apply that to everything after that leading up to the gusset. So there's definitely gonna be math involved, but <laughs> after trying to flip that pattern, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm gonna be better off going with math and just being willing to maybe have to do some ripping back. If the gusset ends up not exactly in the right place, maybe having to do some surgery if I end up having to steal yarn from the bottom, but I think that's gonna be the way to go. I think that makes the most sense out of all the options. The other option that I was mentioning in the last video, I was originally thinking that I was gonna start this with the provisional cast on. So I would just knit the bralette entirely as written in the pattern, just starting from a provisional cast on instead of a regular one. And then with whatever leftover yarn I had, I could just knit down from there to use up whatever's left and add length. But then it was brought to my attention that in a rib stitch pattern, you will see a provisional cast on because you will see where the stitches become like offset by half a stitch suddenly. So you get like a very clear jog. And I ran out of space on my phone and had to take it out of the tripod to clear some space. So hopefully this is remotely where the camera was. I just know that I am not going to be happy with that. I will notice it, it will bug me. So the options are basically go top down somehow or do lots of math, do potentially multiple mid project blocks and just kind of feel it out that way, being willing to do some trial and error. And I think that the latter is probably going to be the one that makes the most sense. I just have to go into it with the right attitude. Okay, it's officially giveaway time. So if you're interested in trying the Chao Gu 4.5 millimeter US 7 needles, all you gotta do is be subscribed to the channel and leave a comment down below telling me whether you've tried shorties before. So tell me, are you in camp? I know that I love them. Or are you in camp? I'm just really interested to try them. And tell me what you think you might like to try making with them. If you'd like to get a bonus entry, I will add an optional criteria where if you post an Instagram story, sharing a video from my channel and tag me in it at Allison Rowan on Instagram, I will add an extra entry for you into the draw. And this giveaway is going to be open regardless of where you are. Honestly, these are so thin. I think I can just send them letter mail. So anywhere in the world, just be subscribed and leave a comment. If you want the extra entry, post to Instagram and tag me in it. That's it. So good luck. All right. So that is all that Copper and I have on the knitting front today. <laughs> but I do have some bookish and other creative things to chat about if you'd like to stick around. So as usual, I'm going to go through the other creative stuff category in our knitting podcast format. So as for finished objects, I just finished reading Fourth Wing, which <laughs> has been discussed on this channel a few times now because for months, my sister had been campaigning for me to read this. I finally picked it up and then I had to shelve it when I went to Italy because I was not bringing a book this giant in my carry on only packing. And the couple of times that I checked in with it, I was still not like totally on board. The first time I think I was about 80 pages in and my sister had said, I got super obsessed with it at 100 pages. So I was like, okay, I feel like we're like crawling up the roller coaster, but like hopefully that means we're like about to go down. And then the next time I gave an update, I was like, I'm like a couple hundred pages in and like it's still... It's getting better, but I'm still not sold. Now, this morning, I finally finished it. Now, what do I think about this book? I find this really hard to like give an overall feeling about because the last 150 pages, I had a great time <laughs> and it ended and I was like, oh my God, what happens next? But those 150 pages come after 350 other pages. So like as a ratio, that's not great. A lot of the books I like to read are 350 pages or less. So it's like I have to read an entire book that I'm not entirely sold on to then get to read a really good book. And I was waiting if I want to read the second one. And then I found out that the next one is 640 pages. Do I have to read like 500 pages before it gets good in the next one? I don't know. So I'm very like 
I don't know what to do with this book. Like I had a good time at the end. I think what I was struggling with before that was just like just not really driving with the writing style of it which then at the end when like all these different threads of the story are finally coming together and stuff's finally really happening and you know everything's getting really exciting the writing style really stops mattering as much because the story has just gotten really good at that point and you're invested but like do I have another 640 pages of that in me I don't know I might maybe try it as an audiobook while knitting I have very like mixed experiences trying to use audiobooks but I wonder if this might be a case where it makes sense. I don't know. So if you were wondering whether I was ultimately going to get into this, I still don't even know <laughs> what to tell you. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this book. I think this is one that I'm going to have to like give it a few days and let it percolate and see how I feel about the next one. Like do I actually want to read the next one or do I just want to like read a plot summary to find out what happens next and that's enough. Not really sure. And then as for creative whips, so if you've been here for a bit, then you know that I, in addition to being a reader, I also love to write and I am trying to work toward publication. This is the goal that I've been working on for a few years at this point. I have written and queried one manuscript that didn't really go anywhere. So now I've completed, revised a million times. I'm now starting to query my second one. And in the last video where I gave an update on this, I was saying that I was kind of in this like endless process of trying to revise the query, trying to revise the first five, 10 pages, which are usually all that agents see before they decide if they're interested in seeing more. And they kind of have to do a lot of different things. They have to do so much setup while still being like super entertaining. They have to kind of leave it at a place where the reader really wants to know more. And I was saying, hopefully I will soon be able to come on and be like, I finally sent queries and Hallelujah, we've sent some queries. So if you're unfamiliar with the process to publication in a query, it's sort of like a cover letter that you send out to agents being like, cover, that was a very dramatic sigh. A query is basically like a cover letter that you send out to agents pitching your book and they have this sort of very specific format and they just, they're really difficult to nail. If your writing is really well suited to like writing fictional prose, that's a really different kind of writing than writing a query letter. So it's very hard, but gone through many reviews. Shout out to Jamie, a viewer of the channel who I actually connected with and she helped me do another round of revisions on things. And I feel like it's finally at a place where I was feeling good about sending it out. So, so far I've sent out, I think four. So I just started sending them out the other day. I've been trying to just kind of do like one a day and then I'll probably stop once I've hit 10 because you, you don't want to query everybody at once because if you kind of realize that your current submission package of your query and your pages isn't working for you, you want to be able to take that opportunity to consider revising it again. You don't want to have sent a version to everybody that's not working for anybody. You want to still have options that you can send a revised version to. So now I have a few more to send out, but then it's basically just a waiting game where most agents will take weeks or even in many cases months to get back to you. So once all 10 are out, we just we just chill and we hope that somebody's like, hey, can I read the rest of that? That sounds kind of interesting. Wish me luck. So once I'm done sending out those 10, I need to really get started on fleshing out the next manuscript that I want to start because in my experience, the best way to survive the ongoing waiting and inevitable mass rejection of querying is to just already have one foot out the door and be working on something else. So I need to really get working on that something else. Finally, future plans in the other creative stuff arena is what I'm planning to read next because I just finished fourth wing this morning. So I don't have I don't have a reading whip, but I think my next read is going to be a reread of Turtles All the Way Down by John Green because, <laughs> so there's kind of a story of this. So if you are like me, a diehard John Green fan, you probably know an adaptation of this is coming out really, really soon in May. And I don't normally reread things, but I don't think I processed like 75% of this book the first time that I read it. Because when this book was released, John and his brother Hank did this huge tour. They were putting on this whole show, it was this whole big thing, and I wanted to go so badly. Because like John and Hank Green are probably like the two people who I don't actually know who have had like the most like formative impact on my life. So I wanted to go so badly. The closest they were coming is New York, which from Toronto is like I think like nine-ish hours by car. And this was in 2017. I decided to do a repeat of what I had done the previous year in 2016. I desperately wanted to go see the show Hamilton before the original cast left on Broadway. And this was when it was like impossible to get Hamilton tickets and they were reselling for like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But I was like obsessed and I was like, is there any way I can make this reasonable? So I found a resale ticket for $700. Blech. 
that was very close. It was like maybe second row, but like way, way, way off to the side of the stage. So it had like a partial view. There's a column kind of blocking like part of the stage, but it was so close to the stage. And it was sort of like the only ticket that was a price that I could even like remotely begin to consider. And I was like, if my ticket's $700, like I cannot pay for a New York City hotel. This was in 2016. I was like, I cannot do both of these things at this stage in my life. There's no way. But I discovered that the Greyhound bus from Toronto to New York was dirt cheap. And there are overnight ones. So what I decided to do was take back-to-back -back overnight Greyhound buses. I think this cost me like $70 return ticket. I would just sleep on the bus and I wouldn't have to pay for a hotel. <laughs> And is it great sleep? No, especially when I learned you don't just get to stay on the bus the whole time. Every few hours they stop, turn all the lights on and make everybody get off the bus while the driver takes a rest stop. Which like, yeah, please, by all means, safety. I understand, take your break, that's great. I just really did not understand that I was going to be forced off a bus at like 4.45 in the morning to go sit at a Dunkin' Donuts inside like a random station in Pennsylvania. Like this just really was not like in the itinerary that I thought that I was on. So was my sleep as good as I hoped that it would be as a person who generally can like sleep on a vehicle, no problem? Um, no. However, by the time I saw that John and Hank were doing this tour, basically all the memories of like the struggly parts of that decision um, had left my brain. I think in large part because like seeing Hamilton was absolutely worth it. I would do that trip again the exact same way in an absolute heartbeat. That's like one of my favorite things I've ever done. So when this came around, I was like, sounds like I gotta go back to New York. I gotta take another overnight Greyhound bus. And I did. But what that means is that when I received this book at the event, and then of course desperately wanted to read it as soon as possible, I was reading it at like one in the morning, waiting for my bus to show up after I was already running off of extremely limited and poor quality sleep from the previous night on the bus on the way into New York. So suffice to say that I really had extremely limited brain power the first time that I read this book. And before I watched the adaptation, I would really like to read it properly. So I think that's going to be my next read. Also, that event was incredible, by the way, 10 out of 10. No, no regrets on the overnight bus yet again. All right, that is everything. That's all my nits. It's all my sort of creative worldly stuff that I've got to chat about. So thank you so much for watching, especially if you stuck it out all the way to the end, even with the non-knitting stuff. I appreciate you. If you'd like to be here next time, I hope you'll consider liking and subscribing and I'll see you soon. Bye.